Howdy, and welcome to a very special YPG webinar designed to give our young professionals a, st a strong backbone in district energy. To begin, let me introduce one of our YPG's original founding co-host, Chase Davis. Thank you, Doobie. Anyone who's been involved with IDA for any amount of time knows that they are second to none in great technical education taught by experts from all corners of the industry. However, for those of us early in our careers, or even those of us who are already knowledgeable in our areas of expertise, it's easy to get lost in the details and forget just how all these different pieces fit together. Uh, in YPG, we're developing the next generation of leaders through the building of networks and increasing engagement in the district energy field. And it's in that spirit that we decided to take a broader brush approach with this webinar, take a step back and look at district energy from the bird's eye view to understand how it all comes together while trying to gather a little career advice along the way. And thus we created the District Energy Mini Masterclass. I'll turn it back over to Chase Doobie for a little housekeeping and let's get the main event going. Doobie. All right, thank you, Davis. So before we get to the start of the show, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, this will be a two-part webinar and we'll be doing questions in the middle to kind of break up the two parts. Uh, to submit your questions, please use the Q&A section to submit those and then Anyone with the first name Chase and last initial D will be gathered. Uh, it will be recorded. So for those who are unable to submit or to watch all, you will be able to check back in. And with that, I now turn it over to Mr. Juan Ontivero. Well, it's, um, it's my pleasure to be with you today. Uh, I, what I'm trying to do here is, since this was a, a really intended to try and be uh, for the young professionals. Uh, some, of, some of the concepts that I'm gonna talk about are really kind of at a high level, uh, the first part of it, and then we'll answer some questions there. Uh, I know that some of you that are a lot more experienced in this, in this industry, uh, I'll probably be really basic. Uh, the second part of it, I'll talk about uh, maintenance operations and optimization, and, and also really try to touch upon uh, leadership uh, a bit because it is intended for young professionals. And so we need new leaders. And so hopefully I can help you guys expand your, your thinking and uh, uh, about uh, leadership. So with that, I'm just going to jump right into this. Uh, you've seen this diagram. Uh, this is a, an IDEA diagram. It just basically shows uh, the, the concept of a heating and cooling plant that's serving a, a region, but it can get pretty complex. And this is just to give you an example of how UT Austin's uh, uh, situation was. This first gray box here is the power generation cycle. It has the combustion turbines, boilers, and steam turbines that produce power. And then here's is the chilling stations, the five cooling plants with thermal storage. We also have a hot water plant that serves our medical school. All everything we have here is two tunnels. And you can add on to it, whether it's buildings or uh, a PV or, or wind, whatever the deal is. And so you can see that it serves a, a pretty wide, a, a large area. This is about 400 acres, 160 buildings, all the way from a, a healthcare, all the way to just a classroom or a public assembly. So it's just, it's, it's just to identify the complexity of the, how the things can develop. Uh, you may not see things like this uh, everywhere. Um, so just what I wanted to talk about here was some of the considerations that, you know, you all are in a very broad, uh, the IDA is very broad in terms of the kinds of members that we have. You know, we have service providers, we have equipment providers, we have uh, 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 plant operators and so on and so forth. So, so what I'm thinking about here is to talk, explain to you some of the things that you should think about as you go into a, maybe a study uh, someone is interested in expanding their system or, or going into CHP for the first time or district energy for the first time. So some of the things you should consider. So you, you want to look at really, it, depending on what, that, what the, the requirement is, electric, cooling, and your heating needs, what are they? You know, so you also want to, and I'm going to expand a little more about that later on. You also want to uh, decide, you know, uh, is accessibility to fuel a challenge? For example, on our campus, we have we have the luxury of two 600 psi gas mains. Not everybody has that, and so that's a, a serious consideration because you're dealing with an infrastructure that is not the owner's. 
and also water and sewer. You, know, you need water to make energy. So, and then you also need to blow down towers and 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 things like that. So you need to have access to sewer. So those so sometimes those things can be overlooked in in the assessment. You also want to look at uh, sometimes the utilities are are interested in you connecting. Some of them not so much. So there could be issues related to the. Uh, just getting cooperation from the vendor, even from the utility. They may have incentives that you could use. So they may also have disincentives. So just, just be aware that's, that's another consideration. Another one is emissions. You know, some parts of the California, uh, they may have emit, uh, control issues about cooling tower emissions, uh, uh, but mostly it's uh, generation, it's boilers and uh, generation. But, and so, in, in Texas, for example, the EPA, even the EPA overseas, is the oversight uh, overall for, for everything. There is a state agency that regulates it. And the state agency sometimes can be challenging. And just something to remember. And then in our campus, space was really a big constraint. And we were, our plant was right in the middle of the campus. So we had to always think about, okay, how can I do this? What do I have to get rid of? What do I have to move in order to be able to do whatever it is I'm going to do? And uh, so that was a very big, serious consideration for us. Architectural considerations. On our campus, this is a, this is a shot of our Chilton Station 7. It's a 15,000 ton plant and a 6 million gallon thermal storage tank. And it's, it doesn't show the campus in the background, but you can see that it's, the color scheme is, is our orange brick and uh, a kind of a tan color. So our, our concept, on our objective in, in the things that we added to the campus was to try and make it blend in and so that it was not a sore thumb. It's kind of hard, hard to hide a, a 76 volt foot, foot, foot ball tank and 110 foot diameter. But eventually, as other buildings got added on, they actually becoming more and more invisible. Um, you want to look at uh, histor historical data if there's available. A lot of places don't have it. And so that's a really a big challenge, but you also want to understand are they planning to grow? For example, in my tenure at, at UT Austin, we added 8 million square feet over 20, 26 years. So I, my challenge was, how do you keep up with that? How do you plan for that? So you gotta look at heating and cooling and, and electricity and, and depending on what it is your, your objective is. So looking at historical data as much as you can, and I'm gonna spend a little bit more about that later on, some additional considerations. Is there an, is there an emphasis on sustainability? This is a growing thing and our campus, we're very dependent on natural gas and we're really tied to it. And the way our system is works, it's it's too efficient, too, too cost effective, makes it a real challenge to compete for renewables to be able to compete with us. But there is a growing pressure on it. And uh, every campus is doing this, trying to go net zero. Uh, but re is renewables uh, an issue in what, what fuel type you want to use? If you're in a coal area, in our case, we already were natural gas which is half the coal car, uh, carbon content of, of coal. So it was very difficult for us to make improvements. Another thing to consider is, well, you're gonna be comparing against the status quo. What do they currently have? And uh, what are the electric, so you wanna look at the electric rates, uh, natural gas or their fuel costs. You also wanna really look at, at what utility costs, that's, that's water and sewer. In our case in Austin, some places it's very inexpensive. In Austin, it's not so expensive, not so inexpensive. And you know, we pay up to thirteen dollars for combined uh, water and and sewer. So it, all those things are very important, especially because you need the water to be able to, to produce energy. Are there expectations for reliability and efficiency and resilience? Uh, in our campus, that was a very big deal. We have five hundred million dollars worth of research going on all the time. Plus, now we had a medical school, and now lives are at stake. So what are the expectations? Uh, and, and sometimes you have to tell, guide the client to what it is they want to do. They don't may not, they may not know. They may be relying on you. So you need to raise the questions, become understand, understand what their base for, uh, concerns are. Uh, base your decisions uh, on life cycle cost analysis. And that's for each of the, you may have multiple options that you're presenting to the client. You wanna compare apples against apples as much as you can. You wanna include the capital costs 
uh, any debt that may be related to that, uh, annual purchase utility costs, uh, operations and maintenance costs, and really over a 30 year period. The equipment that, we, that you put in, that we'll put in in a district energy and CHP system have long lives, 30, 40 years is not unusual. So you, the advantage of doing this, at, I made my living at UT Austin doing this. And so long as I had more avoided cost, really not savings, it's avoided cost over debt, I was really positive cash flow. So that was really, not everybody has that luxury, but that's something that you want to hopefully achieve. Uh, you want to make sure that you, as part of your operations and maintenance costs, you know, what are the staffing needs? What are, the, what are the kinds of positions and titles that you need? And uh, what kind of skill sets are needed? They're different it's, uh, than just operating a cooling plant. If you're operating a CHP system, it's a different kind of ignition. The controls and everything are much more uh, involved. And uh, maintenance is also a challenge if you have, especially if your liability is a big deal. And uh, you wanna be able to do, for example, maintain your, your chillers in the winter so that they're available in the summer. That's the kind of thing that I'm talking about here. And I think it's important to look at things from a total cost of ownership. And that's, you know, the total cost of the entire operation uh, is, is important. It was important for us. Uh, we were a zero-based budget. So it, I, I had to break, in, break even every year and in the budget. So all my costs I had to recover that year. So is there a cost recovery process? Is there, you have to develop rates? all those kinds of things. Um, and these are gonna be done by a third party uh, for the maintenance and operations. All those, there's, there's considerations for that as well. And our, our schedule, is schedule an, a, an issue? Um, uh, how fast do they want it? It may be realistic, it may be unrealistic. Uh, so part of this may be telling them what they really didn't wanna hear, but they need, it's your job to try and explain that to them. The next thing I wanna talk about is Okay, so you have data, maybe you have data, maybe you don't, but you want to refine that baseline and uh, uh, versus a projected average monthly electrical and thermal load profiles. You can use the Department of Energy, Department of Energy uh, and ASHRAE, various, various ways to do this, but you can refine it to more accurately reflect what the future may bring. Because if you're doing a, a performer or developing a last year cost analysis over a 30 year period, you want to be able to say, well, what is it projected? What, is, what do they say? What does the, what does the industry say that might happen? Now, you want to also want to right size it. And so that the performance supports the optimized thermal and power generation. So I'll, I'll expand a little more about that as we go along here. But basically this just shows you uh, what it is uh, for our cooling plants at UT Austin. So we, you can see our power to cooling uh, was 25 megawatts all the way down to like three or four megawatts. And so that you want to do this over a full year, you want to see what that profile is. It's very, very important as you go through this analysis. So an example, for example, here is, you know, if you look at, this is what our, our uh, 8760 load profile looked like. You know, uh, went up to a peak of 32,000 tons and uh, down to a low of like 4,000 tons. And so, but the important point here is you want to design, you have to design the plant to be able to handle peak conditions, but you don't want to operate your plant at peak conditions for when it's not at 76% of the time, it's not non-peak. So if you do that, you're very inefficient. So there's a lot of techniques, a lot of technology available now that can help you optimize how you do this. And you can be efficient really at all the levels with available technology. Um, some some just a, quick considerations about CHP. You know, if you want to do base loaded, uh, basically you, you're operating consistently at full capacity, but you don't produce all of the load, whether it's electrical or thermal. Thermal load following, uh, designed to increase or decrease the rate of thermal generation to meet the demands that basically are thermal load following plants. Uh, electrical load following is matching a facility's load to a CHP system. So uh, that's another option. And then you want to go island mode. You want to, you want to be able to think about island mode. Island mode means, you know, can if, if in our case on UT Austin, uh, if the grid has problems, we actually do cut off. And we uh, most of the time we run in parallel with the grid 
We use a grid C, uh, frequency to control our system. We get, need to be able to, to go into isynchronous mode or island mode. In our case, uh, we, we, we have that feature. That's a, a desirable now. Uh, for example, I saw in the news yesterday uh, that the Northeast is gonna be going through, could be going through some going blackouts this winter. And so this is something that maybe your client is interested in doing. Uh, just to real basics, just I'm really trying to just really just identify concepts to you uh, uh, about the various options. Chillers, there's a whole variety of the different options for chillers, but this is just the basics. From electrics are typical, a steam turbine drive, you're using steam to actually make cooling. A heat recovery chiller, you can produce heating and cooling simultaneously. Absorption chillers, if you have low, lower quality heat, that you're trying to, it's a waste, and you're trying to do something with it, absorption chillers may be the option. Uh, there's various cost benefits to one or the other. I'm not gonna, uh, it, it depends on the need of the client. Uh, cooling towers are very important. You'll need a cooling tower to be able to run a steam turbine because you've got to be able to condense the steam. Uh, you also need a cooling tower for cooling. So the main factors related to cooling tower selection is it really is it factory assembled and prepackaged, or is it field directed? In other words, designed specifically for it. the tower that you saw that was for that fifteen thousand ton plant was a field directed tower, was a fiberglass tower, and our choice was we wanted to choose the tower that had a five degree approach <clears throat> because that has very very significant uh, improvements to the chilled water production efficiency. So, but there are other options also are are they steel, are they concrete, or the fiberglass. So those are our different options to consider. But bottom line, don't just go based on low, the lowest cost. I use a lower, uh, last type of cost analysis. One tower over a longer term, may be more expensive at front, but over the over a 30 year period is more efficient. So it may be a better value. So those are all the things that you need to consider. Another one is uh, thermal storage. You know, uh, whether you use ice or chill water, or, and, and now the growing trend is for hot water. And uh, so there's various cost benefits, efficiency impacts, depending on where you are, maybe the electric rates incentivize one versus the other, utility may be incentivizing one or the other. So, so this is, these are things to consider in the process. Um, another one is pumping. You know, so if you look at, you know, what you want to design your system so you don't have build constraints into your system from the very beginning. And so this is just like the, a chill water system. There are various options. You can do variable primary, you can do primary secondary, you can do constant primary and maybe headered. In other words, four pumps serving all four chillers. Dedicated means one pump serving one chiller. There's challenges with that. Uh, same thing with a condenser water system variable flow, whether it, or constant flow, uh, whether it's headed or dedicated. So, so the, if you think of this one, in, in my opinion, this is the most efficient. Uh, the variable primary and variable flow. It allows you to take advantage of optimization to the best advantage. Boilers, uh, I'm not gonna really, I did, I'm really just really basic here. Uh, whether it's fire, it could be steam or hot water, and you, maybe it's a heat recovery steam generator. It's taking the exhaust from the combustion turbine to make steam. So all of these things uh, are options, as well like, as I said earlier, uh, thermal storage for hot water. So, so talk to one of the things that I think is important is if you're developing a system, is uh, and something that we rolled into our thinking was designed for failure. You know, so what I mean by that is, you know, something things or something's going to happen. So a turbine trips, and uh, so you lose the power, but I also lose the steam. And uh, the advantage I have is I can import power because I have a 25 megawatt standby agreement, so I can import power, so I can cover the power side of the turbine, but I can't cover the steam side of the system. So the boilers are basically handle can still keep the steam flowing to the steam turbine so I can keep a part of my product, my, my generation running. And so basically the others 
are in cold standby. So these two boilers here and these uh, three steam turbines are on cold standby. They're, they're not running. Now, if there's a serious issue and it's long, long enough duration, you have the option of maybe bringing it up if you need to. So those are all the things to think about. And this is an example of designing for failure. To build your build it into your controls and uh, so that you can deal with issues. And so that's a really important part of the setup. Uh, so the result, if you do it this way, for us, uh, for UT Austin, uh, the power steam is provided with high reliability, high efficiency, and high resiliency. I think our average heat rate was like about uh, 9,500 to 9,800 heat rate, which is pretty good, and uh, or 48% efficiency if you think about it that way. So <laughs> the other the other challenge is so a typical utility, they're just basically producing electricity, and uh, they're providing voltage and frequency to you that for you to use in your facilities. So that's basically what they're doing is they're balancing the loads against the generation. Well, if you get into the kind of systems like the microgrid that we have at UT Austin. So you have the same thing, you have the electrical generation, but the electrical generation is also making steam. And which is now also serving a building load. And then that steam makes more generation, uh, electrical generation. So all those are all very intertwined. And then all electrical generation produces chill water. So you're balancing all three, electricity, heating, and cooling. And so it's, it's very challenging to have all these pieces and parts working together. There's a whole lot of, of, of sub equipment that's, that's running in your plants to keep everything going. So it's just, you only have is water and gas coming in and there, and that's it. That's, that's what served our system. And that's how this balancing act really was done. <clears throat> so the key to it is you have to have a very holistic controls integration. That's really the key. Everything, that's what keeps it going. So there you have your electricity. So you have standby power. I have implant standby. And that's, that's the stuff that was cold that I could run if I need to. How do I manage my loop out, electricity out to the buildings? We have a SCADA system that allows us to see what's happening in the, in the campus. We also have a load shed system. So for example, if I, if I am, I, am I landed, um, I synchronous. Now I produce all my own electricity. I'm really dependent on myself. If I've got too much power, I've got to do something with it or I don't have enough power. So I got to be able to load shed electricity or chillers, depending on the situation. So in steam, <clears throat> same thing. You have an implant standby, multiple boilers, multiple. <clears throat> if you design them, you have a heating load, you put in two boilers at 50% so that you have at least half of it if one trips, that kind of thing. Uh, you also want to have a steam shedding system. And my steam turbine, if it trips on campus, that's 400,000 at peak load at 25 megawatts. It's a 400,000 pound steam load I have too much of. So we have a quench vessel that allows us to shed it. For the, if I have an upset, it allows me to stabilize things. My controls control manage, manage all that. And I can then fix it and get it back online if I need to. Uh, chill water, you have reserve chillers, you have PES, you also have a loop management because you're sending chill water out to the campus. And that's a very chill water for us was between 30 and 50% of the total electrical load. So it's, you had to pay a lot of attention to how we did that. <clears throat> and then all the auxiliary plant, that's the cooling towers and the, the pumps and the fans and everything else that you have in your plants that are supporting all the equipment that's running. And you want to have plenty of reserve equipment. But all of that is, and your controls need to be timely. We need to be able to erect quickly. Uh, you need to have redundant processors. Uh, if, if your primary processor fails, you don't want to trip your entire plant. So do you have, will it roll over to a redundant processor allow you to keep online? <clears throat> Network security has become a very big issue nowadays uh, with all the hackers and everything that's happening around the world. So network security is another consideration. You can do all those things uh, if you think carefully think this out. <clears throat> so, so really, the way we manage things was applying a holistic approach to total energy, and that's power production. Uh, this how you distribute it, 
your building design, your cooling, and your heating systems. All of these things you're, you're distributing throughout the campus. You do all those things correctly, you reduce your fuel and water needs. And so the, the concept I kind of want to introduce it here is that you take a balloon and you try to squeeze it down with your hands, it will pop out in different spots. If you do this right, uh, you want to avoid the pop-outs. Don't have any pop-outs. That's the, that's the objective that we tried to do. And uh, I think we were pretty successful at doing that. So the key to everything working is, yeah, you have all the controls and you're balancing all these things, but it's the microgrid system controllers that regulate electricity, steam, hot water, chill water to your campus. So here we're operating net zero to the grid. We didn't buy any power. We didn't want to buy power or sell power. We always want to be just zero. Uh, it was a maximum, a minimum, uh, maximum take of 500 kW. That was it. So we had redundant transformers in our substation, four or 15 NBA transformers in a ring. So uh, one could fail and everything still was online and you could still serve the campus. And the standby, standby power was uh, fed in through all four of the transformers through the 25 megawatts. So then you have the, the, the generation system with combustion turbines, heat recovery steam generators and steam turbines. So then the boilers support the steam generation and also steam the campus. Uh, so there's electricity and, and steam uh, going to campus. Then all the electricity we produced with the chill water plants, five plants, 6,000 tons, all electric. And also, we also use the cooling plant cooling system to do inlet air cooling. In Austin, it's very hot. So in the summertime, you can get a very serious UV on a combustion turbine. A 45 megawatt turbine would only maybe give you 36 megawatts if it's 100 degrees outside. So if you can cool it to 58 degrees, you can get the full 45 megawatts. So you have a penalty in terms of cooling energy needed to cool it, but it's almost a five to one gain in efficiency. So it's a very quick payback. And then you have the thermal storage system that allows you to Basically, we use our, our, our thermal storage. Our chiller loads for the campus were actually the highest at night than they are during the day because they're producing the chill water for the thermal storage. Well, that sounds like wasteful energy, but not really, because what's happening is your combustion turbine is most efficient at high peak than low peak. And so the amount of energy up to use of fuel to produce that KW is, if, if it's at a higher load, is less. So that's the objective. You know, so I'm saving money in gas and the combustion turbine by running it at a higher load at night. So it saves me fuel. And then I'm using that efficient cooling along with the most efficient chillers in the day to serve the system. So, so this is just, these are all things that you can do uh, to, operate, uh, to operate systems. So all of these services basically are behind the scenes serving the campus, heating, cooling, hot water. So, the, so there's a lot of stuff, a lot of data. So you need a good historian. Uh, data acquisition is very, very important in an analysis. Uh, this is just a screenshot that I have. Uh, we, we use Hanaro software, uh, is an IDA member. Uh, so we do real, you know, real time monitoring. We can do analysis. We gather, we can gather one second data. We go back if we have a trip. We can do troubleshooting, we can analyze it. Uh, you, you can keep track of your, your key performance indicators. You can do predictive analytics and then blah, blah, blah. So depending on, you can have one plant or multiple plants. It doesn't really matter. So you, these are our, our systems that are, are readily, readily available and uh, very easy to use. If I could trend it, pretty much anybody can trend it. So it was a very effective approach. But you need to have this. If you don't, if you don't have a good historian, you really cannot optimize and it makes it very difficult for you to troubleshoot. With that, I guess uh, I'm into questions. All right, thank you, Juan. For the first part, uh, we, we have a few questions that we'll ask, but to stay on time, we're just gonna ask you three of them, Juan. The first one is in regards to life cycle cost analysis. Edwin asked, when things are constantly changing, as we've seen, it's hard to predict the future. Um, he asked kind of what's the purpose in doing such an analysis? Is it just comparative? And he follows that up with, would you have made the same decisions knowing what you know now? 
Yeah, it's a good question. So um, initially, if you, if you only base your decisions based on return on investment, you may end up making the wrong decision. Because in my particular case, for example, um, yeah, if I just look at have this project and I look at the return on investment just for that one project, but then if I'm really improving efficiency, I'm using less fuel. So now really the fuel that is impacted is the total campus. It's a very different picture. And so uh, I think that, uh, we, for example, cooling towers, I'll just go, I'm gonna go back to cooling towers. Uh, we did a life cycle cost analysis for a 60,000 GPM tower, a big tower, six cell, uh, tower, tower one that we put in there, Chase. And uh, when we did the life cycle cost analysis, we determined that the tower that we chose was really what was more expensive first cost but because of its efficiency over a 30-year period was cheaper so it's you can really change dramatically change how you think about doing things uh now now it's also you have to educate your client your client may not understand this but i think it's important to understand it because uh you gotta be able to maintain it you gotta be able to live with it over the term of of, of the life cycle of that equipment so I'm gonna give you just one exa example of buildings. A building, uh, if you build a building, $100 million building, and over the life cycle of the building, the actual total cost, including maintenance, is five to eight times that cost. Well, it's very similar for utility systems. So it's very, very important. You should consider a life cycle cost analysis. Now, I know there's a lot of variables. Uh, low growth, is one variable. Another variable is fuel, energy, uh, electricity, or gas. But all you can do is, is based on the best information you have when you do this. As long as you use the same assumption for the fuel, for all of the options that you're considering, it's a valid comparison. All right, thanks Juan. Uh, next question comes from Michael. Uh, are the barriers to implement implementation based more on technical challenges or stakeholder management policy or, policy or regulatory? <laughs> yeah, all of the above. <laughs> yeah, so I think a, a big part of the, your challenge is really truly understanding what does your client want? What does he needs? And so you may have to guide them on all of these issues. And so, yeah, uh, re environmental regulations may for example, a diesel generator, you can't use a diesel generator. It's not good to use a diesel generator for a continuous 100% power because of the emissions. And so a natural gas one is good, but if they have a need that that generator be able to respond within 10 seconds, a gas generator can't do that. And so there, there's a lot of factors that go into this. And uh, for example, when we did our, we did a big expansion our, on our uh, high voltage substation well, to do, I had to grow it and the campus was growing. My substation was maxed out. And so in order to replace it, to do that, I had to replace all the switch here in the park lab. So those are all things that are very situational, unique to what that, that specific project. So yeah, it's all of the above uh, that have to be considered. There are a lot of experts around. Uh, I didn't know very much about any of these things, but I, I learned, uh, had to learn about these issues as I went through the process. Thank you. All right. One uh, one more question. Yes. When does it become economical economically reasonable to convert from an HVAC system to a district energy system? Um, you know, what are some of the benchmarks you look for for making that switch? Yeah, that's always a very difficult thing to do. Uh, I had to do this for the medical district. Uh, we were going to build it was that cooling plant that I showed you that picture of was the most expensive cooling plant of TES system I ever built. It was around ninety million dollars. It's a lot of money. <clears throat> so, so what I so the way to compare it, and then the lo actual load for the medical district was much smaller than the total capacity of that plant. The plant is designed, in fact, the one behind me is designed to be able to add five thousand more tons to it if I need to. And add more heat as a, there's uh, six 2,500 ton chillers to my left, and then a 600 ton heat pump chiller on there that has space for adding two more. That's for making hot water for the medical district. 
So it's the, the load that the actual medical district had at the time was much smaller. So what I did it, what I do, I had to do a comparison of centralized versus distributed generation. You had to do it based on the actual load. So I did it based on a smaller scale. I hired a consultant that helped me do that. They, they do this for a living uh, and compare one against the other. The actual cost was in our particular case around $17 million a year more to do a distributed versus generation. So you have to go through that study. It's all unique to your particular circumstances, but it's no one single answer for that. Uh, you have to do it based on, and there's plenty of people around in IDA that can help you with that. Thank you, Juan. Uh, so we stay on time. Let's go ahead and continue on with the second part. Okay. Good question, so appreciate that. So the next thing I wanna talk about really is, and uh, I, I obviously I believe in holistic approaches and uh, to I think organizational performance, you can build, you're building all these systems, but people operate it. And so you have to think about organizational performance. So uh, we believed in trying to create a culture of high performance, that's really, helps with the reliability and efficiency and the maintenance side of things. So you need to organize for success. And I'm gonna briefly touch on each one of these things. Uh, training and safety, you know, you're dealing with high energies. Uh, you're, 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 uh, so safety is a very big deal, but also you're operating very complex systems. So people have to understand how the total system works. You know, for example, one idea there is um, maintenance personnel. If, if an operator cannot, doesn't have a piece of equipment available to him, well, you can't run the plant. So maintenance has to be subservient almost to the operations folks. So maintenance is a very, another part of it. You, you want to schedule off peak or off schedule off, off year maintenance for things. Uh, for example, what on our combustion turbine, uh, if you do a major overhaul of the turbine, it's about $2 million worth of parts. So I just, the way how, how you schedule it and for the years, and then you do a sinking fund to, to set aside money each year so I don't have to do a balloon payment of $2 million on my budget that year. So those are the kinds of things that you have to think about in, in the maintenance side of things. Incentivizing mistakes. And I'll talk a little bit about that in a, later on. It sounds strange, but uh, if you don't take a risk, you don't get a gain. That's just our philosophy. Uh, you want to have performance standards so that you know uh, how good you're doing now versus yesterday. It was very difficult for us to compare ourselves against others because nobody had a system like ours. And so we decided we're gonna compare ourselves against ourselves. So the historical information and how am I doing going forward it is a very important part of the process. Teaming with partners, and we'll talk a little bit about that as well. You, my partners, I'm talking about maybe equipment, original equipment manufacturer vendors. You're gonna be dealing with them for 30 years. So you got to build a long-term relationship. If you have an adversarial relationship with them, you're not going to get anywhere. Data network planning, I talked about that briefly. Uh, and then innovation. Yeah. There's always new innovation coming into our industry. Applying it uh, takes some of that incentivizing mistakes uh, into consideration. So I'm going to expand a little bit on this. So, so let me, a lot of this, this is about people. And this is a work institute. Uh, in 2021, a report they had says people quit managers, not their jobs. And uh, employers demanded that employees be more agile and flexible, but employees want the same from employment. So this is kind of what's happening now in this, especially post-COVID era. Uh, managers really are the secret to employee retention. You have a tough manager. Uh, behavior concerns are... Uh, significance, so some things are the professionalism, a lack of support, poor treatment of employees, poor behavior, poor communication, lack of manager competence, and lack of manager fairness. So these are just things to think about as you go through this. If you ever get the uh, luxury or the opportunity to become a manager, uh, don't pass on the bad things that were done to you. Pass on the right things. So in the 2020 report, they, there's some thoughts that really came out here that were, that were I thought were important. Uh, managers who are strong, critical thinkers 
and lifelong learners inspire longer retention from their teams. So you can pass on that knowledge to them. They believe in you, they get more buy-in to the process. Uh, managers enable collaboration, increase engagement, and improve productivity. Obviously, the reverse can happen too. So you want to do the positive. Uh, they possess, more importantly, the ability to influence and impact change. So you want to prove that it involves change and you want to be able to influence that and bring it along with you, not against you. Um, organizing for success is just a, a snapshot of kind of how we were structured when, when I was at UT. So that was the AVP, then I had associate director of plan operations, manager of operations, a shift supervisor, and an assistant supervisor. And then I had three levels of operators. And so the, really the thought here is the assistant supervisor is a supervisory training. So the supervisor goes out on vacation or whatever, the assistant's there to take over that. Manager of operations is an associate director in training. So anyway, that's the, the concept. And it's very difficult to find good people. That's just our world now. And so what we tried to do to try to help ourselves is we also had another level below the operator. And it was a training. And uh, this is a buddy from a, maybe a, a, a teaching institute or a community college. <coughs> and so they maybe were trained as a plumber or, or electrician or whatever. There were opportunities for them to come in. So that if you have a good training program, you can hand that to the trainee. You can learn about the process in going through the, uh, up to the organization. But what this also does is it creates a career path where people, you, people are going to move from lower paying jobs to higher paying jobs. That's just normal. You want them to move inside your organization, not outside the organization. That was the concept that we had. <laughs> so to, to accomplish the trainee and the, the progression of salaries, we had a mandatory test-based training program. And so they had 18 months to certify for their job. Uh, if they didn't certify, they didn't get fired. They just didn't, they just it got impacted in terms of their evaluation. And so all of the merit, all the merit increases were directly proportional to the evaluation score. So that was a date to you. Now, if you did, if you did, it incentivizes people to improve. And uh, in the, the, the time that I was there, they completed something on the order of 10,000 hours of training. Now I had 190 employees. That's still a lot of training, training they would not have gotten. It gives an opportunity to move up in the organization. Our process was it, you had to certify for your job. Once you're certified for your job, you can pre-certify for any other job. And we had various employees that took advantage of that and moved up in the organization. So it encourages <clears throat> superior performance and it's a critical tool to onboard your employees. I talked about that. <clears throat> and if it facilitates the succession planning. So really, because the concept here is <clears throat> the best innovation or tool applied wrong waste time, money, and really can cause a loss of confidence. Take a hammer, apply it for the, try to use it for the wrong end, you're gonna hurt yourself. So you wanna apply that tool right. There's a lot of tools out there. So maintenance planning. So <clears throat> you know, skilled technicians, you know, they, in our situation at UT Austin, we did all the maintenance in-house. And so, so the majority of the, 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 skill, the things that were done were done in-house, mechanical, electrical, instrumentation, controls, programming, distribution, maintenance. Now, our advantage was, and we felt strongly about it, it's lower cost versus contracting work. We used to do overhauls on a, on a big turbine contract, and that used to cost $800,000. Instead, I could pay $300,000 of overtime to my existing employees, which gives them a benefit, and they earn about more. So if I say $500,000, that turn around and reinvested back into the operation. So I think it also improved the quality of work because as they train and gain more experience, uh, they get better and better. So the ownership of the work also, you know, if a maintenance is done wrong on a piece of equipment, they have to fix it. So they're incentivized to make sure it works done right. And it helps morale because when it worked, okay, it, morale was good. And uh, so you can create a real strong knowledge base and experience that allows you to do rapid troubleshooting and, and, and resolve resiliency issues in your operation. Now you can do this contract 
So not everybody can do this, <clears throat> but these are all things to consider even in, if you go to a third party maintenance or operations. So, so maintenance planning in the power plant is, is a lot of stuff. So preventive maintenance, in our case, we started out with, major, with, with minor overhauls and we eventually evolved to major combustion overhauls and, and power and boiler inspections. And so, you know, basically I was that what's important is to have a champion technician, establish, build that guy, build that guy, build that person or that, that lady uh, that, that will, and it also helps to monitor and maintain your inventories. You wanna have spare parts when we do the overhaul, or you have a problem, you have the spare part, you can quickly get things back online. It helps with scheduled maintenance and assists the maintenance supervisors in the scheduling and parts ordering, which is there are a lot. Uh, term and maintenance actions, and for example, involve combustor inspections, hot gas path inspections, major overhauls. So usually it depends on run hours. That's how we, we did it. A uh, number of hours of the unit is when we would schedule these kind of things. Chill uh, station maintenance uh, involves annual inspections on all the chillers. We had our standard was we opened up every chiller every year, so it was very it was a very big challenge. Thirty chillers, and uh, I think uh, it's, it's more than four hundred pumps. I said put four hundred th- pumps in the in the presentation here, but I hear that pie number is probably r- larger. Plus, we also have a remote research campus, so we did. So that our technicians handle refrigerant. They inspect and clean the water boxes and the tubes, all the preventive maintenance on the chillers, including breakers, relays, and instrument calibration. Calibration, I didn't touch on that before, but it's very, very important. You can have all this instrumentation, but if it's not calibrated and you're trying to use that to optimize, well, bad data in, bad data out. So it's, calibration is very, very important. Uh, and also because it's so hot, uh, chiller maintenance was scheduled for the winter months. And the same thing with uh, turbine maintenance. We, we, we do different shifts, bringing guys early, they were, they were early. You know, it's a good benefit for them, but also was realistic because we didn't want someone to get uh, heat prostration, for example. So maintenance planning in, in, in district energy plants are much longer term. Uh, we would think about, about five years ahead at least. And so that way operations were cycled and resources could be shared and you can coordinate your maintenance activities so that, and then make sure you communicated not only just the maintenance people, but to the operations people, because they're the ones they have to do this together. You know, they have a uh, very let's say, frequent coordination meetings. What do you have planned for this week or what problems we have this week that we need to fix, that kind of thing. Uh, you can dig into this and uh, let me know if you have any questions on this. It was just an example that I had. <clears throat> so budgeting, so I, I mentioned this briefly, but, but to avoid issues, you want to do to remain its cost of track and estimated over several years. You want to maybe have a sinking fund. We did that. Uh, we set aside uh, major dollars, significant dollars a year uh, for that balloon payment in the end. So that way, that way it avoids a, a $2 million expense that budget year. Well, my budget was $60 million, but a $2 million hit is still a very big hit. And my boss did not like that. So this was a way for us to, to protect ourselves. <clears throat> so I'm gonna talk about it, incentivizing mistakes. So the philosophy that we had, because remember we had a training program, we had this layered structure. So our philosophy was if you made a mistake, for the right reason, it's a good mistake. In other words, uh, if you feel you have the skills and knowledge to do something, take the action, do it. It's a very, in this business, a decision often just takes seconds, in minutes. You cannot wait to contact the boss and say, what do you want me to do? Something you still gotta do it. And so if it makes mistake happens, let them do it. And uh, if an error was made, which this kind of environment can create mistakes, let, let us know, let management know. We will help mitigate it. That's our job. And, uh, and in fact, it was my, my philosophy was, if we made a mistake like this, it was my mistake, not theirs, because I created the environment 
that allow them to make that decision. But you want to make sure you identify and document the root cause. So what actually caused the issue? And then you want to use that root cause to teach the others okay, what not to do. So it's a learning thing rather than a punishment. Now, if they keep doing things the same thing over and over again, that's a different story. So, so in, in terms of incentivizing mistakes, <clears throat> micromanaging actually del can delay decisions and can cause, cause hesitation in the process. So you can cause problems or even an injury. So if you punish somebody for making an error, right, a good error, as I mentioned earlier, if it leads to punishment, they stop making decisions. So a good error is management's responsibility. And a success is not for me to take, it's for the staff to take and for them to celebrate it. So it's, this is how you can incentivize your workforce to do the right thing. Um, so what should be the benchmarks? I mean, that's just it. That's, that was a big challenge for us. And against whom? So we, we chose to measure ourselves against ourselves. And so that involved expectations for safety, maintenance, data quality, emissions, training, last cycle based analysis, all of these things. Expectations were set for all of these things in terms of how we did business. Again, it's towards creating this culture of high performance. Um, the goals that you set need to be stretch goals. You never quit, never sit on your hands and, and say, okay, well, we did, we did really good. I'm gonna stop. You, you gotta keep going. And what's the next thing? Always strive to improve your performance. That's just, I think in your personal lives, no matter what you do, <clears throat> this is a good objective for you to consider. Um, when you measure system performance, it's system performance, not just a component, not just the chiller, not just the pump. It's, it's the total power production, the total chill station production, you know, our kit every ton for cooling, uh, something that we monitor very closely, as well as our heat rate. And so we're very, and then also how much fuel we're using to make the total energy we deliver. Those are all things that we me measured and monitored very carefully, because that's proof that you can use to go back to your boss and say, okay, well, we also need to do this project. And while the past is not a proof of what I'm going to do in the future, I have a pretty good record. And so you, you can use that to leverage the next project. So teaming with partners. And so what I'm talking about here is you want to improve. So we did, we use a lot of partners, uh, Termas, Emerson, these are all uh, IDEA members. And so they all have their own specialized innovation. And so the, the, the theory that we approach that we use was improve. If they improve, and we're going to work with them to make sure that, that well, we have want to make this change or that change and improve, if it improves their system, at the same time, it's improving me. It's improving our system. So their success means they're going to be around for the long haul. And so it also means you will too. So this is just a philosophy. If you build an adversarial relationship, you're not going to achieve this. So data network planning. So you want to, I think it's important to master plan digital controls, you know? And so I think, you know, what is, what is you all eventually want to do? Technology changes so fast. And uh, there are a lot of system improvements and optimization is going to drive the data and network changes. So you want to make sure that the system uh, it can complement you and do that. So I, I think the other one is on in the issue of innovation, just don't be a reluctant leader. So if you get the opportunity to be, become a leader, to, to be a leader, uh, so just some general thoughts I'm gonna give you. You know, be paranoid in how you implement things, but don't let paranoia influence your managing staff actions. So the controls are our paranoia, how we did it, but we had to make quick decisions and you cannot be paranoid about doing that. Uh, use the skills and knowledge of your people to the max. There's a lot of expertise, a lot of practical knowledge, you know, but if you have to bring them along with you to succeed. If you don't bring them along, they can cause you to fail. So you don't want that to happen. And, and the, you, you, you want, don't be afraid to fail, but you want to fail in small increments. So basically, you want to trip, 
you don't want to die. So that's the, the, the concept uh, in general. It sounds kind of scary maybe, but it, uh, it works. It really improves morale and buy-in into the process. So an in issue of innovation, make one change at a time. If you do five things at once, you don't know which one worked or didn't work. Did it help? If it worked, fine, great. Continue doing it. If it didn't, stop. But okay, what's the next thing you're going to do? So the approach, approach, my approach is, you know, that, that we use, that I use, and maybe my, guy, my folks did not like it so much, but it was what I thought. If we cannot prove that we cannot do it, we're going to try it. So it's very hard to prove that you can't do something. So they pretty much told them was, the theory was, okay, we're gonna try it. Now, but we use what we call the IQ principle. It's just something we created. Uh, Roberto Real uh, started this out and, 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 I, and we, we built on it. So it's basically incremental improvement using innovation. What is the innovation? I'm gonna incrementally implement it. And then I'm gonna see the improvement keep going. So it's a cycle and that you go through. So kind of a general statement here, a diverse workforce that has a strong sense of self-worth, has a say in how things are done, has fair compensation and leadership that is even-handed, training and responsible authority. That was a, a something that I coined is a, is a productive and successful workforce. A responsible authority is, everybody wants authority. Everybody wants to be the boss, but they're responsible to go along with it. You cannot have one without the other. So the concept we had was a chain is as strong as the weakest link. So don't be a weak link in the chain. That was, so I said that a lot of times to my folks and I, I believe in them. And uh, they then believe in themselves, and that means your organization is going to be successful. So this is just something that I found uh, on the web. This is Mindy Gibbons, uh, Real Thought Leaders. So I'm just going to read it to you because I liked it. Uh, leadership is having a vision, sharing that vision, and inspiring others to support your vision while creating their own. So kind of the concept here is, you don't want to push people to a decision. Instead, you want to use your elbow to guide them to the decision. So it's a, it's a slightly different approach. It can take a little longer, but if you do this, you're going to be strong. And so you want to, so that whatever vision you have for the organization, there are certain parts of what they do. They have to create their own vision for that, whatever they do to support your vision. So anyway, that's that's the concept. So I think a big part of it is I had to be willing to evolve. So I'm old. So to give you an example, I've been 45 years in engineering. So I started with slide rules, punch cards, no cell phones, and, and no calculators. So uh, as digital controls with, with Fortran. So this is a long time ago. So this is, if those of you that don't know what a slide rule looks like, that's what it looks like. Uh, this is a punch card and a master's thesis had 1500 of these. And uh, so when I was, I was director of facilities at UT El Paso in the 80s. So there was no email, there was no internet, into the electronic calendars, there were no cell phones. So yeah, those were the first cell phones that we got, they were like bricks. So this is just, so bottom line is, I eventually, we eventually at UT Austin uh, graduated using artificial intelligence, using neural networks in our process. So think about this. So you're, young in the business, uh, what are you going to see in your lifetime? So you have to be willing to evolve as you go along and be hungry about learning. Uh, I say become childlike. A child learns a lot in, in the first you know, 10 years of their life. Uh, you want to become like them. You want to be a sponge, absorb everything and, and say, okay, how, how am I going to use it? So you can, if you do this, you can do a lot of things. This is just some of the awards that we won at UT Austin. And you can see it start, we started in 2005 all the way to 2020. So we just never stopped on trying to improve ourselves. And so uh, these were useful.
from this. It's not just about winning the award. It's a very important because I'm trying to sell the next project or I'm trying to do the next thing. Well, my boss, these are independent awards that we won. And so it showed them, okay, we're obviously on the right track. We know what we're doing. So it just helped to validate the process. So with that, I got some questions. Yes, sir. Thanks, Juan. So first question comes from Encore. What is the typical payback that you encounter for district energy projects? Yeah, again, it depends on what you have, right? Uh, so, so in my period, in my term, I'll give you an example. I'm just going to give you total numbers. We, had, we, did, we implemented $259 million worth of projects. That's a lot of projects. And that involves over a period of the 20 years. And uh, so debt was long-term, 30 years. Some, some 20 years, of most, most of it was 30 years. And uh, in that, in my tenure, we actually saved uh, 200 and, uh, $150 million, just fuel. And that's flat, that's not counting growth, and not counting cost of money over the long term. So it just really depends. And uh, chilling stations are very difficult to pay back. <laughs> I'm just telling you, uh, they're very, very expensive. And the return on those is, is very difficult, very challenging. But if people need cooling, you got to do it. And so you got to figure out what's the most cost effective way to do things. And, and you can cut energy. In my tenure, uh, we cut, well, in the last 10 years, we reduced the, the electrical need to cooling 40%. That's, so all those things contribute to the payback. So there's no real one number. I can tell you it's going to depend on the uniqueness of the project that's going to get implemented. Thanks. Juan, uh, we had a couple questions about being a net zero to the grid. Um, there are two questions. One was it because uh, the rules about it or was the profit not there? <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, most people don't know, we, at UT Austin has been producing their own energy, their own electricity, 100% since 1929. And so the reason that was created, they decided to go down that road then was because the grid was not reliable. Well, the question to you is the grid reliable now? <laughs> so it seems to be said there were periods where it was okay, but now it's not okay. And so we don't know what the future is gonna offer. So the, the, the decision was, well, we're gonna to continue to be self control our own future, control our own destiny. And so we wanted to continue to, to be, use the grid as an extra generator. So I had 25 megawatt SAM agreement. So it was really an extra generator that I could use for my Beckett now. I had to pay for that, right? But it was rolled into my cost of operation. So it was just the cost of operation was needed. Now we chose not to sell energy, I had extra energy. My peak was 60 megawatts. Uh, total capacity was 134. So you can say, well, why am I not where? Why aren't you selling? Well, I want to use my most efficient equipment for myself because I have a performer that I'm trying to, to save on. And, and I don't, if I use my most inefficient equipment, it's going to hurt my performer. Now, if I sell, I don't want to use, it doesn't pay for me to sell my most inefficient equipment because now I've got to maintain old stuff more often than I currently am. And so it just, and then plus also a risk. If, I, if I'm selling and let's say the grid goes down or that whatever happens, it could impact the canvas. Versus, vice versa, if, uh, if, I, if, I, if I have my, my system trips, uh, then I've got to, I'm responsible for the energy that I contracted, that was contracted to buy. So now it turns from a benefit to a risk. So those are all things that need to be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. That was just our situation. All right. Next question comes from Daniel. What, when thinking of implementing district energy, can this decision be done without consideration for the national grid, or I guess in your case, the Texas grid? Yeah, no, I, I think you cannot. Well, you cannot uh, because if you're, if you're truly going to build a system that's 100% uh, redundant, in other words, you're going to do self, complete self-generation, no reliance on the grid. Uh, it takes a lot of expense. 
because you have to have redundant equipment. If your primary unit goes off, what's going to be your secondary unit, and so on. So all the way down the process. And so it, it can become very, very costly. Uh, but in our particular case, uh, we chose to keep using the grid. And in fact, we use the grid not only just for generation, we use it for emergency generation. So we have standby generators for buildings, there's emergency generators, uh, but we have also have the option of where the primary power and the grid is the secondary power, so they're the emergency power. The theory being, you're both not gonna go down at the same time. And so that's, that was a way that we did things as well. Plus we also used a third route, but I won't go into that because it's a little more complicated to explain. But anyway, that's, the, the grid can be a benefit, can also be a detriment. So it just depends on the situation and, and uh, the, re the region that you're in. All right, Juan. Ali asked for our 80,000 ton hours of storage, our two TES tanks. Is that capacity good for two to three hours? And, you know, can you explain that? And then, you know, how's that used? Yeah, so, so I think the way we use, we use the thermal store, the, the 80,000 ton hours, basically for basically to provide cooling for the campus for about eight hours. That's, I think that was the way it was designed. However, that's rare when you need that. As you've lost cooling, you need to provide the cooling. The campus, our peak was uh, 40, 30,000 tons. So you can, you can serve the majority of it uh, with, the, with the, the thermal storage. So that was, that was the reason that we did it. But it also serves as a reserve because we also ch chose to not discharge all of the tank uh, every night. And because if a chiller drips, it can serve as a reserve chiller. And uh, so anyway, so there's two different tanks. Uh, so the way we actually discharge the two tanks is we use one tank prime first, and then we use it up. And then we run the second tank. And it's basically through our optimized system, it's using optimum energy. Uh, it's, it's not just time of day. It's mo most people think uh, that most people implement TES is to save money because they really they use, more, use more energy. They're using more chillers at night which is more energy and you're putting in the tank. In our case, uh, but they saved on off-peak power. Well, in my campus, I, uh, we, in the camp at UT Austin, we did not, we didn't, we didn't buy power. So I didn't have an off-peak rate, but I saved on the generation side because I made my combustion turbines more effective. So anyway, that's the concept was behind it. It, it allowed us, it allows us great, great, great flexibility. Another big flexibility is if you, you've got to shed load, Power. Let's say you need to for some reason. Well, you can shut chillers off, and you only have to run a pump to run your TES tank. So it provides you a good backup service. So anyway, it's it, that's how we use it. Uh, it's uh, and plus the one thing to consider: what is the cost per ton to build a cooling plant versus a TES? Now I don't know what your numbers are. And they changed now with all the supply chain stuff, but it was like twenty five hundred dollars a ton to install a cooling plant. I think they're much larger for Shell Station Seven. I can't even do the numbers there, but, but a TES is only like two hundred dollars a ton, so they're a lot cheaper to put in, and they provide you a lot more benefit over long term. So you think of it that way and analyze it that way, and it might help your decision. All right. Uh, so next one comes from Jared. Uh, were there any strategies developed that lowered campus demand? To lower campus demand, yes. So actually, we uh, it took. It's always it was in our case it was challenging because uh, we made the energy and then the campus used it. Right, there were two separate actually two separate empires. Let's call it that way. And so uh, uh, our philosophy was we wanted to, okay control what we control, and influence the others. So, so eventually I was able to convince uh, management to allow me to have energy managers and, their, and stewards. So the, their responsibility was to know the buildings, know the campus. The stewards were given a zone of buildings, a, a, a group of buildings. And uh, for, for example, one was specialized in natural sciences, for example. And their job was to go in the buildings, really work with the building owners and really understand what is happening, what the issues are. 
And then as if there are issues, then work with the energy managers and engineers to try and fix the solution and use the budgeting process in the energy to prove it. So as we were successful with that, and there are even more uh, as time goes on. And we've also have developed very extensive standards for energy. And uh, we have a uh, modeling that we do, uh, that the campus does for the demand side. And so in just, for example, our goal in 2009 was to lower the energy utilization index. That's the total BTUs used per year uh, by the campus, 20%. We passed it. We actually did it five years ahead. So it worked and it helps because then that's energy I don't have to produce. And what it does is it creates ceiling for the campus to grow. If I can reduce my energy requirements, my energy need for cooling, that, that's, we actually cut five megawatts off our peak using the thermal storage and the optimization. Well, that five megawatts, well, that's five more megawatts the campus can add without me having to invest. So that's, anyway, yeah, hopefully I answered your question. Thank you, Juan. Uh, we have another question about greenhouse gas emissions and where do you see the district energy system going in the next decade? Yeah, I think <clears throat> I think there's in, in greenhouse gas emissions, there's no silver bullet. I mean, renewables is not the solution because it's not the it's not the solution because uh, wind uh, is not you can't dispatch it. Same thing with solar, and then and solar is guaranteed to be 50% off all the time. So it's in storage, it, it might be this might help, but that's still very, 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 very expensive and doesn't work itself. I read an article that in California, they're gonna be using wind energy to pump water up to a reservoir because it's free, right? And then, then they use the, the hydroelectric to create electricity. So there's there's ways to do this, uh, but we don't really have that many options in the United States. Most, of, a lot of our country is pretty flat, so there's not many, many hydro opportunities. So there's, uh, so so I think everybody needs to do their part. If district energy is used and used effectively across the country, it will significantly reduce greenhouse gas, and uh, uh, we can go into microgrids and and those kinds of things as well to improve things. Uh, but there's challenges. There's challenges with uh, regulations, environmental regulations. Uh, they see a new plant as a new source of emissions rather than an offsetting emissions, which really in reality is true. The electrical efficiency in the United States is like around 35% average annual efficiency. Well, ours, just electrical, was 48%. So, so the, 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 those are the, the things that knowledge is the challenge. Most regulators don't understand this issue. They don't understand the complexities of what is involved. And so really it's education. We have to educate them. <laughs> and so, so that, that's a real challenge. I think that, I know that Rob and, and IDA has been trying to do this for a long time. But the problem is they keep changing around so you have to keep retraining. So anyway, that's, that's the challenge. Thanks, Juan. Now, uh, we'll go to our last question and we'll uh, probably wrap it up, but uh, remind everyone here that uh, we'll be continuing to answer some of these questions. Um, so kind of stay tuned. So uh, this one comes from another young professional. Uh, you might've met him, Rob Thornton. As a reflection <laughs> on your career, how valuable was your participation in IDA been for learning, innovating, and solving the challenges and operating a highly reliable campus energy system? And would you advise young professionals to be involved in and participate in IDA? Yes, I think I think the the one of the maybe the one that I came to IDA because <clears throat> when I first started at UT Austin, I didn't know anything about power plants. My first uh, the first time I walked to a power plant was my interview. So and that's true. And so I had to learn, and I came to IDA and to learn about this. And uh, I, I, I grew to know the many professionals that are within the business. I learned from them. Hopefully we all learn from each other in the process, but, but meeting them is part of it. But the other part of it is you have to get, become brave. 
and uh, start presenting. You may have a project that you have, and I've learned a lot by presenting. Uh, it's very challenging, can be challenging, can be daunting. People in the audience may be smarter than you, <laughs> and they ask some pretty tough questions. And so, the, but, the, but you gotta go through that process and learn. And uh, you gotta be brave about it. You gotta go through that process and learn. And yes, there's, there's, there's a lot of knowledge in IDEA. I, I strongly encourage you to get involved through YPG, through doing presentations, presenting at the conferences, uh, talking to your peers, maybe your competitors even. So uh, learn from each other. Juan, speaking of that, I'd like to take a moment to tell our listeners what's next. So uh, we, we definitely have some opportunities here. We have Campus Energy coming to Texas in February for 20, Campus Energy 2023. And also, they just announced that the campus uh, video contest is coming back. So if you have some young minds interested in district energy, there's a great contest that they can participate in. As well as uh, another webinar coming up, a uh, large heat pump part two, November 9th. So uh, do sign up for that. And as Juan mentioned, IDA, what a great org organization to be a part of. And of course, you can always join YPG as well. We uh, definitely uh, welcome that. Davis, uh, you want to add anything? Yep. Uh, finally, is uh, abstract submissions are open for IDA 2023 uh, in June. Uh, so um, as Juan mentioned, you're going to be a uh, good way to get involved is to present. So submit those abstracts and you know, hopefully to see you on stage. I want to thank especially Juan for agreeing to help us out and putting together this excellent presentation. Uh, for the remaining questions, we'll share those with Juan so that he can see all his questions. But uh, thank you everyone who joined and participated, asking very great questions. And uh, a big thanks to IDA for allowing us all to get together. Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Have a good day. Thank you, everyone.